though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you, that you, that you. you know, notice he didn't put somebody's name there. All right. He says that you, generic you, that you, that you, that you, that you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Thank you, Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we've given thanks. Father, we thank you for the entrance of your word. Gives light and understanding to the simple. Our hearts are open to receive your word. We ask that your word will come to everyone here present and our lives will be changed by your word. Thank you, Almighty Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a shout of hallelujah. hallelujah. Do well to welcome someone beside you. Say you welcome the church in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a special month for us. It's a month of um, the consciousness of global mission. And we are looking at the global mission as the great commission that the Lord himself gave to us. And as we look at it today, I want our hearts to be open to receive God's word. Amen. Glory to God. Now, I'll start by bringing to our consciousness the word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Um, we start the reading here from verse 5 to verse 9. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Can we say that together? Verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. All right, so who planted? Paul. Who watered? Apollos, who gave the increase? God. Okay. Verse 7, quickly. So then, neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. And now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. The reading of God's word is blessed. Now, in fulfilling the great commission, which is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, making disciples of all nations, there are six things that are very important. And these six things are key players in fulfilling the great commission. Number one is the seed, which is the word of God, the message that we have been sent to preach. Number two is the soil, the people to whom we have been sent to preach the word of God. And then number three is the sower, the ministers of the gospel alongside the body of Christ, given the church to preach the gospel to the world. Number four, the waterer, speaking of the pastors and teachers that God has commissioned with the assignment and the grace to water the seed sown unto harvest. Number five, the reapers, those that have been sent to reap the harvest. In other words, the evangelists, glory to God, and the evangels, hallelujah. Number six, the blesser, that is the increase of God, the blessing of God coming from the Father himself through our Lord Jesus Christ upon the Great Commission such that we have productivity and increase. So these uh, six players are players um, in the field of God towards actualizing the Great Commission. And today I want us to focus more, all right, on um, the sower. We have looked at the message, we have looked at uh, the soil, the people, and then we want to talk about the sower. 
Now the sower here is the planter. It is the child of God, the believer, the preacher. The one that carries the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel cannot be preached without the sower. The gospel does not preach itself. People preach the gospel. As potent and as powerful as the gospel is, without it being preached, it cannot make a difference in the lives of people. So we can say that the seed of God's word, the power, daring, and everything that the seed can do is at the mercy of the sower. It's at the mercy of the sower. The sower is the one that propels the seed. The sower is the one that plants the seed. The sower is the one that preaches the gospel. And it is the preached gospel that is potent and powerful to change lives. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Bible tells us, Paul speaking, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, not just to everyone out there, but to everyone that believes. Now, how can they believe without hearing the gospel? For it is written, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So it is the preached gospel that imparts faith, and when the gospel is believed, it then becomes the power of God unto salvation. So it is the preached word that changes the lives of people, because that is the only word that can impart faith to people. It is at the point of believing that people's lives are changed. Glory to God. So the sower is the preacher. The sower is the one who tells the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sower is the man who carries the message of Christ. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because I am sent by God to preach this gospel. So I'm not ashamed of it. Because the gospel itself is potent to change lives, and I have been privileged by God to preach this gospel as a teacher and a preacher and an apostle sent unto the Gentiles. So it is important for us to understand that we have an assignment, we have um, a commission, we have a mandate, we have a ministry as God's children to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is very important. If we don't preach the gospel, lives will not be changed. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter number 10 and verse 13, it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So it is the preacher that preaches the word, and when the word of God is blasted out, sound, sounds out, sounded out, and released by the proclamation of the gospel, people hear the word, believe the word, and then they are saved. They can then call upon the name of the Lord, which brings about salvation. So the preacher is the initiator of that process of salvation. It begins with the preaching of the word, and then the end result is salvation. It begins with the preaching of the word. The preacher preaches the word, and then people hear the word and believe the word, and then they call upon the name of the Lord and they are saved. So it is the preacher that initiates the process of salvation, without which people cannot be saved. So that means everything Christ has done for us, everything that Calvary has to offer, everything that the finished work of Jesus is embedded with cannot be delivered to people without the preaching of the word. It's as though or as if Jesus himself did everything and then left everything he did at the mercy of the preaching of the gospel by the preachers. So that means the preachers can frustrate. I'm not talking about preachers as in, you know, ministry gifts, pastors, evangelists. I'm talking about preachers, evangelists. I'm talking about believers, disciples of Jesus Christ. Are, are we getting this? Okay. 
So everything that Jesus Christ has done for the world is at the mercy of preaching. Preaching the gospel is what is going to make the difference. You know, that means we can, so to speak, render null and void the finished work of Jesus if we refuse to preach the gospel. Refusal to preach the gospel is actually rendering the work of Calvary null and void. In other words, we are not going to uh, make what Jesus Christ has come to do in the world valuable and of worth to the world if we refuse to preach the gospel. That means God is leaning on us, depending on us. God is saying, you have to preach it. If you don't preach it, then Jesus Christ would have died in vain. God forbid. Amen? So Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. So the sower is very important because the gospel does not preach itself. It is the sower that sows the seed. The seed does not sow itself. It is the preacher that preaches the word, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word cannot preach itself. So until the word is preached, it cannot be believed. Until people believe the word of God, they cannot be saved. It is the word that is believed that God is committed to performing. Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be what? A performance of those things that were told of the Lord. So God will perform what we believe. And what we believe is actually what has been told us from the Lord through preachers. People who have proclaimed the word of God to us, those are the people who carry the power to change the destinies of men. Preachers. And I want you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, you have the power under God to change the lives of men. Tell another person, say, you have the power under God to change the lives of men. All right. God has given us the power to change the lives of men. And what is that power? It is our responsibility to preach the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. That's it. We've been saddled with that responsibility to preach the gospel. So without which the lives of people cannot be changed. So God is saying it's time to preach the gospel. So let's look at the sower very quickly. Now we understand that the sower is the planter, the preacher of the gospel, the believer, the child of God, the one who believes in Jesus. The great commission is not given to ministry gifts. The great commission is given to disciples of Jesus Christ. The great commission is given to the body of Christ. Matthew 28 and verse 18, and then Mark 16, 15. Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Now go ye therefore. He wasn't talking, talking to ministry gifts. He was talking to the whole body of Christ. Glory to God. It is clear, very clear from uh, Mark chapter number 16 and verse 15. Look at it. Mark 16, 15, quickly. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said unto them, the believers, believers in Jesus Christ. And then, uh, much clearer, it is said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse 18. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18, it says, All things of God who had reconciled us unto himself and had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So God has given to the body of Christ the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation is our ministry. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. To everyone. To everyone. So when I say the preacher here, I'm not talking about the pastor or the apostle or the you know, prophet or the evangelist. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm talking about believers, Christians. Okay? So, the sower. Who is the sower? The sower is the believer, the Christian, the carrier of the word, the seed of eternal life. Who is the sower? The sower is the one who is on the go for the Lord. Every sower must be on the go for the Lord. We ought to be on the go for the Lord. The commission called the Great Commission is the commission to set us on the go. Go ye into all the world. So that's the sower, the one who is on the go. In other words, as you move on in life, 
as you develop in life, as God blesses you, as God changes your level, as you move from one level to another level, you are preaching the gospel on the go. Hallelujah. Your life is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything about your life is defined by the gospel. Your life is characterized by the gospel. The gospel has become your motto. The gospel has become your drive. The gospel is your passion. There is compassion in your heart to fulfill the Great Commission passionately. The gospel has become your motto, your drive, your motive, and your motivation. The gospel of Jesus Christ has become what you must preach of necessity. In other words, you cannot but preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16. Why? Because the gospel is a necessity laid on him. Necessity has been laid on me, he said. So what is that necessity? Number one, he saved me that I might reach out to others with the same love, with the same grace that saved me. Amen? So the first necessity that is laid on the sower, the preacher of the gospel, the child of God, the disciple, is the necessity of love. The necessity of love. Second Corinthians chapter number uh, 5. We'll start reading from verse 14. It says, for the love of Christ constrains us because with us, judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That there's a constraining power of the love of God constraining us to preach the gospel. So the love of God is a necessity laid on us. That necessity here says, because Jesus died for you and God saved you by grace through faith, you ought to extend the same grace to others. That is the necessity of love. Glory to God. The second point here of necessity is the necessity of the calling. Every one of us in Christ is called to preach the gospel. And we ought to preach the gospel because we ought to fulfill our calling. The necessity of love is on us to preach the gospel. The necessity of fulfilling our calling is there. Paul said something very profound in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20 and verse 24, about fulfilling his calling, his assignment in Christ. He says, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, what is he saying here? He's saying that necessity is laid on me to finish my course, number one, with joy, and then the ministry which God has given to me, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of, of God. So what does that mean? The necessity of the calling is upon us. There's a necessity of the love of God, the compassion that births passion the compassion that governs passion, the compassion that mentors passion, the compassion that drives us to want to reach out to people that we were saved by grace through faith, the love of God saved us, now we are extending the same love to others. By extension, we are ministering to people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Secondly, there's a necessity of the call of God. You want to fulfill your call. I want to fulfill my call. Paul wrote to um, um, Archippus in Colossians chapter number 4. Amen? I believe verse 17. Look at it. He says, Say unto Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. So you have received a ministry in the Lord and you ought to fulfill that ministry. There's a calling on your life that you ought to fulfill and that calling is to preach the gospel. Someone says, well, um, maybe my calling is this and that. Your major calling is actually the preaching of the gospel. Whichever way you can do it, 
just preach the gospel. Before you can get to discovering your specific calling, you ought to give yourself to that general calling, which is the Great Commission, fulfilling the Great Commission. That is your calling. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Find a way by the Holy Spirit. Find the means by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. No matter what, no matter the situation, find a way, find a means to preach the gospel. Whatever the situation is, in spite of your so-called disadvantages or things that are not working according to expectations, listen very carefully, you ought to preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel is a necessity. You have to fulfill your calling. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, you must fulfill your calling. Turn to another person and say, you must fulfill your calling. So Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. There's something you cannot keep for too long. Love. Compassion cannot be hidden. Compassion cannot be covered. You can't cover compassion. You cannot hide it. If you put compassion in a cave, it will explode. Compassion is the drive deep within your heart that the same God who saved me, the same Lord who saved me, who loved me, is now sending me to love others with the same love with which he's loved me. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. So God is sending us to our world. And he sent us already. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. He has. He sent us already to go out there to preach the gospel. So number one, necessity is laid on us by the love of God. Compassion. Bething passion. Number two, necessity is laid on us by the calling of God on our lives to fulfill our calling and reach the world with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So the sower is on the go for the Lord. The sower must not confer with flesh and blood. You must not call a conference with flesh and blood. There is no agreement between you and flesh and blood. In other words, you must not begin to look for the signals of convenience around you, you know, in order that you may preach the gospel. You must not confer with flesh and blood. Look at Galatians chapter number 1. Start reading from verse 15. It says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, Paul speaking here, and called me by his grace, he says, To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now, the reason why people do not fulfill their calling is this conference with flesh and blood. Amen. When was the last time you met with flesh and blood? And you were giving, you know, so to speak, legitimate reasons why you cannot fulfill your calling. You were giving, so to speak, in quote now, legitimate reasons why you cannot do what God has called you to do. All right? Um, when it comes to matters of finances, okay, that cannot wait <laughs> for any other thing. But when it comes to you know, the gospel that can wait. No, it ought not to be. Don't confer with flesh and blood. You will not fulfill your calling just because everything is right and everything is smooth and everything is working out well for you. No, nobody fulfills his calling in the midst of comfort and convenience. Amen. You can only fulfill your calling, all right, in spite of the things that are working contrary against you. And that's, that's how to fulfill your calling. Paul said, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear to myself. In other words, there were things that could move him there. But he said, none of these things move me. You don't call a conference with flesh and blood. All right? And say, when is the best time, the right time to fulfill my calling? On the go, you're fulfilling your calling. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. On your way to church, you're fulfilling your calling. On your way back home, you're feeling your calling. You are looking for opportunities to preach the gospel. You are engaging every opportunity available to preach the gospel. Why? Because that is your calling. Necessity is laid on you. So don't confer with flesh and blood. The sower, the preacher, must not confer with flesh and blood when it comes to preaching the gospel. 
The sower must preach the word in season and out of season. The sower must preach the word in season and out of season. In other words, when it is convenient and when it is not convenient. When it looks like you should preach the word and when it doesn't look like it. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. The sower must preach the word in season and out of season. That means you must proclaim the word, particularly when it is not convenient. Amen. I remember there was a time in my life, you know, people didn't even know what I was going through. This was in 2020. I had serious pain here, okay, and I was in pain most of the time. And apart from when I was asleep and I didn't know, I couldn't feel the pain. But the moment, you know, I woke up, I felt it. Every time I woke up, I felt it. And I carried that pain everywhere I went, preaching the gospel. For some people, they will quit. All right, the gospel can wait. Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Necessity is laid on me. Amen. Some people don't have money. The gospel can wait because they don't have money. They have a challenge. The gospel can wait. All right. The believing God for the fruit of the womb until God shows up, no preaching. It's a deal. Pregnancy and then preaching. No pregnancy, no preaching. Amen. But that's not how it works. Amen. I was carrying pain. My wife was the only witness, you know, said, well, how are you doing, darling? I'm good. Sometimes I couldn't even call my name. Groaning in pain. Amen. I would come here, preach to people. I was going about preaching the gospel. Glory to God. I don't know what Jesus felt in his body. I don't know how, you know, he preached the gospel in spite of all the persecutions and all the things that happened. The Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him. He despised the shame. So there was shame. Amen. He despised the shame. He says he endured the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ. He endured that cross. You don't enjoy a cross. You endure it. Nobody enjoys a cross. You endure it. Hallelujah. Jesus endured that cross and he went on in spite of the shame, in spite of the pain, in spite of the cross, in spite of the things that he needed to endure, he kept moving on. I tell you, real progress is made in the face of opposition. When you are faced with opposition, you are still making progress. That is the way. Hallelujah. Amen. You say, well, I'm waiting for everything to be fine and perfect, and then I'll start making progress. All right, then you have to wait till the new Jerusalem. Because in this world, everything will not be perfect. Amen. So you have to fulfill your call in spite of the challenges you're facing. You will fulfill your call. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. So the sower must preach the word in season and out of season. You're preaching the word in season and out of season. In other words, you're telling yourself, I will not quit. I carried the pain 2020, October, into 2020, December, into January 2020, 21, 2021, into February 2021. And then God, you see, you will be tested, I tell you. Do you know for some people right now, they, they won't come to church because there's there, there's no food at home. Now, are you serving God for bread and butter? Amen. I said amen. amen. Yeah, we need to be encouraged. But listen very carefully. There are times that situations around you, circumstances around you, people around you will not encourage you. You have to encourage yourself where? In the Lord. And then in February 2021, God spoke to me and said, I've healed you. Stand up. I bent over. The pain was gone. Glory to God. <laughs> but I didn't stop making progress. In fact, I have made progress more when I was opposed, when I had challenges. You know, there's something about the deceit of comfort. The deceit of comfort is that in comfort, you think you're okay. Whereas, you are lagging behind. Because comfort tells you that everything is fine. 
so you are not forging ahead. It was in comfort that David was swayed. All right? He had peace all around, and he was okay, comfortable. And so when kings ought to go to war, David felt like, well, I'm fine now. It's time to relax and enjoy my victories. And the Bible tells us that he looked down from the attic of the palace, and he saw a woman taking a bath. Glory to God. Bathsheba. Bathsheba. All right? The queen of Sheba. Okay? Bathsheba. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? All right? She was very beautiful. And most of the time, do you know that people backslide in comfort? All right? True test of a man is not in prosperity. It is in adversity. You didn't hear me. We can all behave ourselves in prosperity. True? You can behave. But in adversity, people misbehave. If you can behave correctly in adversity, you're, you, in fact, you have passed your test. Amen? Mm hmm Look at what happened to Paul and Silas at Philippi. They went to preach the gospel, right? And right there, they were seized. They were beaten. They had stocks in their legs and chains in their hands. And they were thrown into the innermost part of the prison. They didn't go to preach you know, their own gospel or they didn't go for marketing of their own product. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ they were preaching. Amen? But something happened. They were seized and thrown into the prison. And the Bible tells us that at midnight, they complained. Now, how many times do we complain in adversity? What kind of God is this? I'm serving God. I'm doing this. Is this what I should be going through? Amen? I said amen. Amen. Are we going to live our lives according to the Christianity prescribed by the Bible? Or we are going to give in to an environmental Christianity? Amen? Are we going to read the temperature of the environment as, you know, um, thermometers? Or we are going to set the temperature of the environment as thermostats? Amen? So what, what do you want to do? What are you meant to do? The sower must preach the word in season and out of season. The sower must speak the word of God without bulging. Without bulging. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In other words, you must speak the word of God day and night without bulging, continually. Continually. Amen? Continually. Glory to God. Now look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 9 and verse 27. Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 9 and verse 27. Okay, it says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. We ought to speak the word of God without bulging, boldly. Amen. Bold declaration of the word of God. You ought to declare God's word boldly. And then in verse 29, same chapter, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. But he was still speaking boldly. Amen. There is no shame in boldness. True? Uh huh. You ought to be bold in declaring the word of God. You ought not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
you ought to open your mouth boldly to declare the gospel. You have identified with the gospel. The gospel is your life. Your life is the gospel. You ought not to be ashamed of the gospel. You ought to declare the gospel boldly. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 14 and verse 3. Amen. It says, Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord. They were speaking boldly. It ought to be our life, speaking boldly about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anytime anybody's asking question as to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are ready to answer boldly. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Man. The sower must preach the gospel boldly. Boldness is involved. We speak the gospel boldly without winking our eyes. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 19. Okay? And for me, that utterance, Paul said, pray for me. That utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth how? Boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. You are making known the mystery of the gospel how? Boldly. Boldly. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. The gospel works when it is declared boldly. We declare the gospel boldly. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Boldly. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Quickly. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake you. That we may boldly say, because the presence of God is with us. The Bible says, lo, I'm with you, even unto the end of the world. Hallelujah. Jesus promised us his manifest presence that as we go forth to preach the gospel, he is with us to the end of the age. Glory to God. So we declare the gospel how? Boldly. Amen. Then the sower must rightly divide the word. The sower must rightly divide the word. You must be apt. You must be skillful. You must be proactive. You must deliver the word um, with aptitude. In other words, you are telling the gospel the way you ought to tell it and you are rightly dividing the word, um, cutting through the minds of people, discerning their hearts, discerning their status, discerning how to rightly uh, present the word of God. The presentation of God's word for you must be very, very apt and skillful. Rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, understand what the gospel is all about. In preaching the gospel, do not omit the basic ingredients of the gospel, the basic content of the gospel, the basic foundation of the gospel. And Paul presented this gospel very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians 15, if you start reading from verse 1, read to verse 3. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Now, this is the gospel that Paul preached. It says, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory, if you remember, what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. What did he preach to them? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received from the Lord. How that Christ died, death, died for our sins, According to the scriptures. So Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures. So the death of Christ for the sins of humanity. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. So Jesus has, had to die for our sins committed by us. He didn't commit any sin. So that we would not die the death that was due us because of our sins. So he took our place as our substitute, and he became that substitute, the Lamb of God that died for our sins. So Jesus died the death of Christ, because there's no resurrection for the living. There's only resurrection for the dead. 
And the core of the gospel here, number one, is that Jesus died. He died for our sins. He didn't die for the fun of it. He was not murdered. All right? He didn't commit suicide. He died for our sins. Why? Because he needed to die for our sins. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he took our place and placed upon himself, God placed upon him the penalty for our sins. He became the ransom, the price that was paid for our sins. Hallelujah. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Powerful. Powerful. So the Bible tells us here that the death of Jesus Christ for the sins of humanity is one of the major pillars and contents of the gospel. Skillfully, you present that to them. If you take that out, the gospel is incomplete. And an incomplete gospel cannot save people. Okay, so the dose or dosage of the gospel must be complete. You don't take out something out of it and say, okay, well, uh, this one will work. No. An incomplete gospel is no gospel. Amen? The death of Christ for our sins. Go on, verse 4. Quickly, quickly, quickly. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to to the scriptures. So that means the death of Jesus Christ, the burial of Jesus Christ, and his resurrection. These are contents of the gospel. Of necessity, these contents must be part of the presentation of the gospel that we make or give to people. Amen? Okay? Now, Paul put it this way when he wrote to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter number 10, Romans chapter number 10, if you start the reading from verse 8, speaking of the righteousness of faith, it says, what does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth and your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. So what did he preach? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, he says, thou shalt be saved. So God raised Jesus from the dead, and by raising him from the dead, we are saved there is justification to us. Hallelujah. Amen. Can someone say hallelujah? hallelujah? Glory to God. Amen. That's the gospel. So number one, the death of Jesus Christ. Number two, all right, his burial. Number three, his resurrection. Number four, you can see number four there. If you will confess with your mouth, come on now, the Lordship of Jesus, the Lordship of Jesus. You must proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Acts 2.36, when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, he was declared both Lord and Christ. Glory to God. Amen. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both, come on now, Lord and Christ. Both, come on now, Lord and Christ. I can't hear you. Both, Lord and Christ. So he's both Lord and Christ. Glory to God. Both Lord and Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the basic ingredients of the gospel, can we go over them again? Number one, the death of Jesus. Why did Jesus die? Why did he die? Good. You must stress that. Amen. Number two, his burial. He was buried. So the old man died with him. We're coming to that. And then was buried with him, but the new man was raised together with him. Glory to God. Amen. So, the burial of Jesus, number three. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, number four. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, these form the contents of the gospel. In our presentation of the gospel to people, we must include of necessity. These contents, the burial, the, the death of Jesus Christ for our sins, the burial of Jesus Christ, all right, and his resurrection and his lordship. Glory to God. Amen. So we present the gospel with aptitude, 
with skillfulness. We present the gospel with um, creativity. We have to be innovative in the presentation of the gospel. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. Amen. amen. The sower must handle the word of God with genuineness, sincerity. You must be sincere in handling the word of God. In other words, you don't water down the word of God just because of the environment. That if you don't say it this way, they may not accept the word of God. We are not playing to the gallery. We are presenting the truth of God's word the way we ought to. Hallelujah. So there must be um, genuineness, sincerity. There must be devotion to the presentation of God's word as we stand before the people to present the word of God. We must have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We must not handle God's word deceitfully, not walking in dishonesty or craftiness. Look at what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. It says, but have, start from verse 1. It says, uh, therefore, since we have this ministry, which is the ministry of reconciliation, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Look at verse 2. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. It says, no, no handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to the conscience of every man in God's sight. So that means that we are presenting the word of God the way we ought to present it. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Present the word of God the way you ought to present it. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. Now, half, half truth is no truth. In fact, it is more damaging than ignorance. Glory to God. So, no craftiness, no dishonesty. No craftiness, no dishonesty. We present the word of God the way we ought to present it. How? We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We're not walking in craftiness. We're not handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the presence of God, in the sight of God. And that's what we do as sowers of the seed of eternal life, as preachers of the gospel of Christ. This is our assignment. This is our responsibility. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. And this is very important. Okay? And then as sowers, we preach Christ, not ourselves. You preach Christ, not yourself. You ought not to preach yourself to people. Preach Christ to them. You know, the gospel, the revelation of God's word is in us, yeah. But we are not to present ourselves to people. We are to present Christ to people. It is Christ that saves, not you. Amen. So it is important that we present Christ to people. The apostles preached Christ to the people. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 5 and verse 42. Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 5 and verse 42. It says, And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So that means they were teaching and preaching Jesus Christ to the people. Again, the Bible tells us here, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse 23. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 23. But we preach Christ Jesus crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. We preach Christ Jesus. So we are meant to present Christ to the people. That is the message that saves. The gospel is not the gospel of Apostle Shegon Baje. In other words, it's not good news about me. 
It is not good news about Pastor Funke Obaji. It is not good news about Pastor Moyo Dejide. Amen? It is good news of who? Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of Christ. Amen? So we present the gospel to people. The presentation of the gospel here is very important. Amen? Amen. Present the gospel. The gospel must be presented to people. In other words, it is the gospel of Christ, good news about Christ. So we tell the people what Christ has done for them. Can someone say amen to that? Yeah. Yeah. We tell the people what Christ has done for them. Glory to God. So this is the ministry of the sower. So you preach Jesus Christ to the people. You remember when Philip went to Samaria? What did he do? He preached Christ in Samaria. And there was great joy in Samaria. Miracles happened because he preached Christ there. Christ. Christ. Not self, Christ. Can someone say amen to that? You preach Christ. Glory to God. Now, what did Paul preach? He preached the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8. That was what he was preaching. All right. The wealth of Christ. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So he taught about Christ, the wealth of Christ, the riches of Christ. And he talked about how that Jesus Christ died for them and was raised again from the dead. Can someone say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Amen. That is the gospel. It's about Jesus. It's about Christ. It is about the one who died for the world. It is about our substitute. It is about the high priest. It is about the one who came and was raised from the dead because he had died for the sins of the world. Can someone say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Yeah. This is the message we preach. This is the message we preach. And every one of us ought to give ourselves to preaching this gospel. Now, don't hold back. Give everything you ought to give to the preaching of the gospel. And I want to encourage you this morning. This is our assignment. This is our ministry. This is our calling. This is what God has called us to do, everyone, to preach the gospel. Praise God. Can we be upstanding, everyone? Lift up your hands to God and commit yourself to the preaching of the gospel. Lift up your hands to God. Commit yourself to the preaching of the gospel. Glory to God. Pro talambro shoka di la braha. Lengro sucra ti la braha de le grusha ti le brohota la gria. Ronto crusha tila mahangre kosha tia. Granongre saka tila brohon telegrisha katea. Zadengre sokotongli krasi prahaya. Lift up your hands and commit to the preaching of the gospel. Lord, we commit, we commit, we commit, we commit, we commit. Manengre sokre tegla krusha tila brahaya. Branangre suka tegla krusha tila brahaya. Nangre katengle de grusha katile brohota lagria. Go ahead and commit to the preaching of the gospel. Go ahead and commit to the preaching of the gospel. Go ahead and commit to the preaching of the gospel. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. All right, if you're there, you're not born again, I want to pray with you right now. You need to surrender your heart to Jesus. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? What shall that man give in exchange for his soul? I want to pray with you now. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands above your head. I want to pray with you. Anybody like that, you need to be born again. You need to be born again. Raise your hand above your head. Glory to God. So this is a company of saints. (laughs) Amen. Raise your hand above your head. Is anybody there? Thank you. Can you help that beloved one forward? Come, 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 come. Hallelujah. Come. God bless you. 
Come on, let's celebrate. Let's put our hands together. <laughs> Glory to God. Any other person there? Any other person there? Any other person there? Encourage them. Let them come. Any other person there? Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Now place your right hand on your chest and say these words after me. Mean every word from the depth of your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I repent of my sins. I confess you as Lord of my life today and forever. I believe that you died for my sins and you were buried and on the third day you were raised again for my justification. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Glory to God. Father, we thank you. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you, Father. Now, Lord, fill this precious one with your spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Say, I am saved. I'm born again. Now I'm a child of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lift your hands and rejoice and give your praise. Amen. Yeah, there's, there's a beloved one there. Just follow him. Praise God. Come on, let's put our hands together for the Lord and give God praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Now, the message I preached on um, Wednesday at Bible study, um, I want you to go and listen to that message. It's on YouTube. Amen. Listen to it and get blessed. Glory to God. It's a message that shows us the practical steps to take in evangelizing our world for the Lord. Amen. Love you. God bless you.